Welcome. Bonjour. Vous écoutez le podcast Dirty Feet sur les ondes de No More Radio. You're listening to the Dirty Feet podcast on the No More Radio Network. Nous sommes vos animateurs et animatrices. We are your hosts, Alison Burns, J.D. Papillon et Stéphanie Morin-Robert. Listen in. Écoutez. We're going to move you. This is a special fringe edition of the podcast. One of several episodes recorded while touring the circuit of the Canadian Association of Fringe Festivals during the summer of 2015. Fringe festivals showcase non-curated theatre, dance, and other forms of art. You can learn more at fringefestivals.com. Welcome to the second episode uh, during which we're going to cover dance and movement shows at the 25th St. Amboise Montreal Fringe Festival. Once again, we're recording on site here at Mainline Theatre, the uh, the company that produces The Fringe here in Montreal. And uh, we're going to be speaking with a, a selection of artists, again, presenting dance works and, and things that are outside of the dance category, but which, we, uh, which we're excited about for their movement uh, content, including a puppet show because because uh, I can't help myself. So we're going to start off uh, the interviews today with uh, Corinne Ann Wicks, who is an artist from New York. Uh, she has performed for Joanne Gould here in the city in the past, both at Lien et Lieu and at the 2012 Montreal Fringe Festival for another project of hers. This year, she is in town uh, doing a double bill with Joanne. Uh, the show is called Unoya. Un langage muet, and the the company name is also Unoya. And uh, so, Corinne, your piece in this uh, in this production, as far as I understand, is uh, is a structured improvisation. That's correct. Yeah, it's a it's a structured improvisation for dance and music. Um, there are three dancers in my company, and one musician. Uh, but we also run workshops while we're in the city. We partnered with Studio Biz. They were really generous with us. And we ran three days worth of workshops, brought in local artists, taught them the score. They had uh, three six-hour workshops to really dig into the material. And then from those workshops, we invited some of those artists to join us on stage. So it's been a really fruitful collaboration. Oh, fantastic. So, so the dancers you brought with you from New York were kind of the... the are, are the consistent ones in each show? And then That's correct, yeah. Some locals kind of trading in and out? Exactly, and every time we mount this show, we, we do a workshop in conjunction with it. Okay, great. So there's still more workshops to come then as well? Uh, no, for this particular performance, we, we did all the workshops sort of before the run. And, okay. And that's how we got our guest artists. But when we perform it again in New York and hopefully elsewhere, we, we run workshops in conjunction with the program. So how long has this project been going on? Uh, we presented it in its first sort of uh, version back in the fall in November. Uh, since then, we've done a performance in March and one just before coming to the Fringe, actually, as part of uh, Bushwick Open Studios with R&D Studios. Okay, and it's called Tripod, the project. It's called Tripod, yeah. Okay. Um, when I first came on to the project, uh, originally it was Jonah Rosenberg, our composer, and a good friend of ours, Martha Cargo. They were working on a score, and they brought me in to create movement for it. And they described the score as a landscape, as opposed to, like, a composition. So when I started creating the movement, I started to think of the choreography as creating creatures inhabiting that landscape. Um, the music has a bit of an alien quality to it, so those creatures I envisioned were a little bit alien, and I came up with the idea of using three limbs to locomote, and that's really been sort of the driving force of the choreography in the piece. Um, everything that happens within it has sort of a callback to that sense of three limbs, and the creatures sort of go through this evolution on stage. And I think that way it gives the audience something to, to grasp and to, and to really dig into. A familiar image of, of something they can relate to? Is that... Well, what I think is interesting about the, 
the idea of the tripod is that there's not a lot in sort of uh, the organic world that, that walks on three limbs. So when you sort of challenge your body to move that way, it's, it's a little bit unnatural and a little bit weird. I mean, we have sort of like a camera tripod, but that's not something that's mm -hmm. very animated. Hmm. So it's sort of the, the departure from what you'd see in the everyday that I think is interesting about it. And working with these, these tools, these objects as extensions of the body, um, how, how did you select them? Or what was that research like? Did you try different ones? Or uh, well, we didn't. We didn't use tools or objects. It's it's the body as a tripedal organism. Mm -hmm. So so using three limbs um, to locomote, and the research process was really just based in the body in the studio. Um, we really sort of worked starting with levels. So starting mm -hmm. with so, say a crawl, or um, we have one way of moving. We call anchor anchor pull which is you, you select one limb to create an anchor with, another limb to create an anchor with, and then the third limb either pushes or pulls you towards those two points. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of a lot of the research has been based in, in that kind of exploration. And when creating the structures, because there is an improvisational base to the project, um, how much of the choreography is pre-choreographed and how much, of it, how much freedom do the dancers have? Um, it's, it's fairly structured. Um, the, the guest artists are part of an ensemble, mm -hmm. and so they have a lot of freedom in the sort of specific decisions they can make, but in terms of, within the piece there are various improvisation modalities, and they, they know when to do which uh, version of the tripod or which improvisation mm -hmm. modality. Um, throughout the ensemble, there's also three solos that happen, and those are uh, they combine choreographed set movement and elements of improv. And this creative process or the way that, that you worked with the different levels, the anchor, anchor, pull, are these all things that you've discovered through the, the creative process of this project in particular? Yeah, definitely. It's, it's sort of like become a world unto itself, which has been really awesome. This is not the first time that we've uh, we've spoken to an artist who's working both in, in Montreal and in New York. It oh, seems cool. to be something that, uh, you know, is it is a trend, perhaps? I'm, I'm wondering if, you, other than your connection to Joanne, uh, what what uh, is appealing to you about working in both cities? Um, I, I really love Montreal. I think it's a beautiful city, and I think it has a really um, great arts community, but also a great audience community. Um, the the amount of people who who come to my shows who have just sort of like pick postcards up off the street and and find it interesting um it's it's really a wonderful place as a choreographer to be um i think the general population here has a appreciation for dance that is hard to find in other cities and that's something that really draws me here and that kind of strategy of guerrilla choreography in a way of just like implanting yourself somewhere and like really working fast at it, at creating a, a piece with locals. Uh, is this something you've done in a lot of other cities? Like uh, you've mentioned a few past experiences. Was it mostly in New York or did you do it? We've shown this piece in New York as well. Um, this is the first piece where I've really implemented that strategy, but it's something I'm very interested in. Um, I, I think it's important that the dance community creates opportunities for young dancers that are A, uh, free. We don't charge for our workshops. Um, it's about an artistic exchange. It's about collaboration. Um, it's it's about giving young dancers the opportunity to gain performance experience with minimal commitment, as well as not having to pay for it. Because everyone's got a got a day job. Everyone has to pay rent. Um, and then for us, it's great because it really sort of lets us uh, inject ourselves into the local community and and build an audience from sort of a grassroots marketing. Place. And when it comes to your own expectations of, of those performers who went to your workshops and who ended up, you know, being picked to, to be part of the actual piece of the, the performance experience, um, how did your previous uh, expectations of, of either the technical level or, or the movement aesthetics that they would bring, uh, how did that change from what you expected you, you've been to Montreal before you took workshops you mentioned to us before um, I guess that you already have a bit, had a bit of an idea of the way that Montreal dancers move um, honestly uh, 
my expectations were exceeded uh, through the workshop process. Um, the dancers that we're working with, they're all incredibly talented, um, but also incredibly like enthusiastic and game and just willing to participate. Um, it was nice because uh, we had three six hour workshops and you know, over the course of those 18 hours, um, a movement improvisation that, you know, I gave them the first day really transformed from the last day. Um, so I, I, my expectations were really exceeded. Yeah. Could you tell us briefly about the, the other half of the, the double bill, the show mm -hmm. Shapes of the Unknown, Figures de l'Inconnu, that is Joanne's piece for this? Sure, I'd love to. Um, Joanne's a choreographer who really focuses on the body. Um, her work, it, it's not necessarily narrative and it, it doesn't necessarily, um, it doesn't necessarily, it isn't necessarily choreographed on a theme, um, but it's, it, it is incredibly emotional. And so I think the audience really gets a sense of, of some kind of emotional struggle going on in, on stage, but there's a real openness to the interpretation of that. Um, Amelia Lamanc is the uh, dancer in the piece, and she's absolutely lovely. We actually studied together at the Movement Invention Project in New York back in, uh, I guess it was the spring of 2012, and she's a really lovely dancer. You mentioned that the genesis of this project was basically um, a musical score, that, that uh, landscape musical score that you've mentioned. Could you tell us a bit more about that, because it was very essential to the creation of the piece? Sure, I'd love to. Um, Our composer, Jonah Rosenberg, he's a Brooklyn-based composer. He's really interested in integrating organic sounds in his music. Um, the, the score originally was for piano and flute, but since then it's evolved, and now we're using primarily electronic sound, but he's also using an electric bass, which he's playing with a, with a bow. Um, and it, uh, the score definitely evolves with the choreography. Um, and it was a really amazing process working with him and sort of developing that uh, natural evolution together. Great, thank you so much. Uh, so this was Corinne Ann Wicks, and she was here to talk to us about Unoya or Langage Muret, which is being presented at the Studio Multimedia on Henri Julien. And you can see the exact dates of the show on the uh, Montreal Fringe website. Next up, we're going to be speaking to Vanessa Jane Kimmins from the company VJK. Uh, I'm going to suspect that those are from your initials. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is a, an artist from Toronto. She's presenting the work Big Footed, which is a, a choreographic piece here in a, at the Montreal Fringe Festival. And uh, notably to, to perhaps fringe audiences is uh, one of your performers, um, Jasmine Fife won the Bush DC uh, award mm -hmm. for most outstanding choreography in 2013. 13. Yeah, great. Yeah. So uh, this is your first time, though, as a choreographer presenting work at the Fringe. Correct. correct? Great. Yes. Well, welcome. Thank you for having me. Now, uh, Big Footed uh, is, is an intriguing title, and so is your kind of promotional uh, material with a big uh, gorilla dancing, uh, breakdancing gorilla. So, so um, It is a gorilla suit, but it is called Big Footed, and there's no Sasquatch suits, so we sort of, <laughs> we're using gorilla suits, but we try to make them look more like a Sasquatch. We put wigs on them. That's because such the face is a <laughs> There's I'm no sorry, Sasquatch we're doing suit it. I know, ever. I know. What is we this? wrote complaints, yeah. We put in a request for a Sasquatch suit, but that's what we're working with, so... So basically, um, you're working with what you have to actually represent Sasquatch, but what you have to say about Sasquatch and the, the different representations that it can have our understanding of the Sasquatch, that's really the core of the piece. Not so much the absence of a Sasquatch costume, but more um, our, our way of perceiving the Sasquatch. You were telling us a bit about the piece. Could you mm -hmm. tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, so um, originally it started. the piece started as um, a solo, Um, when I was doing my master's in choreography, and I did, um, we were supposed to be using a mythical creature and moving like the creature. 
which I wasn't very intrigued by, so I, <laughs> I tried to make it a little bit more entertaining, and I chose Bigfoot and watched a bunch of, of great videos online um, and, and was thinking that we don't actually know how this beast moves and what it does and what it likes to do, and maybe it likes to get down in the woods with all of the other Sasquatch. The Sasquad is what we call it. <laughs> um, <laughs> so it started as like a contemporary dance and then um, moved into... Um, I'm not a break dancer, but I um, I was doing like hip hop and and house in in this Sasquatch suit. Just this notion of, of break dance, which is very uh, very coded to African American community in the and United Latino. States, yeah. and you know a, a big stereotype, a big way of representation of the African American community was uh, monkeys. You know, like uh, through through American history, mm-hmm. was this a link that you got worried about that people would perceive that and say, well, that's racist. Yeah, absolutely. Um, which was part of the reason why we were trying to um, compromise the gorilla's face in particular by putting the wigs on. It was like we were trying to, because it's really the like the face, like when you think of a Sasquatch or the last time you saw a Sasquatch, <laughs> um, it, it's more like longer hair around the face, especially in particular, and different colors. So we had, yeah, if we tried putting wigs on it, Um, they kind of just look now like they're dressing up a little bit. But um, uh, in particular, because we've done the piece before and the cast has changed. So before we had um, we had two um, African dancers, one Jamaican and one... No, t- uh, yeah, two C- Caribbean. So... I was more concerned then. Our cast is a bit different now. It's a bit more varied. And so I think that the link is not quite as strong. Um, but it was definitely something that we talked about and, and tried to, to problem solve because it wasn't, it wasn't the intention. Um, yeah, the street dance and... Or it was allowed to be there as something to think about because, again, it is, it's sort of forcing us to, to look at the way that we've treated people and thought about people and the connections that we've made in the past is just sort of like the idea of thinking about all of that stuff is is there but it's not meant to be a strong connection or something offensive obviously but there are sensitive topics uh, in your piece from what from what i could uh, read in the blurb um about gender power race and all of that mm-hmm. and um Then sometimes can be a bit tricky to explore those kinds of topics. How did you, like, how in the piece do you explore that? You, you mentioned sort of uh, our judgments being imposed on, on something. How do you get to that and looking at that through dance? Because dance is, you know, it's more of a visual art form. Sometimes it can be a bit less precise to convey a message. How do you personally go about doing it with that piece? Um, I tend to um, approach most issues with humor um, and um, setting up expectations and breaking the expectations. Um, so, and, and again, it's not so much that these, all of these, these, um, these topics need to be seen by every audience member, which is, I work with this theme, which is slightly different, like with the Bigfoot. Um, And, and it just comes out in setting up those expectations for the audience members and then breaking them. It forces you, um, and using humor, you laugh. And at the same time, you're like, oh, I was expecting this, which is very true, I think, to real life and how we think is that you have your expectations and, and it's going in a certain direction and you're waiting for that to happen. And then sometimes it like a curveball comes at you and you're like, oh, and it makes you really um, check in with yourself about the way that you look at things, see things, um, yeah, set up expectations for yourself and for other people. Um, after having seen the piece, I, what I really appreciated about it is the, the risk element um, that was kind of always present. And as you mentioned, the, the breaking the expectations or creating expectations. Um, so we, we talked about kind of the costume design element and what that brings and the themes behind that. Um, but what about uh, as far as music goes, how does, how does that process work? Because in house breakdance, mm-hmm. kind of that's like the core of the, the drive of the movement. I'm wondering how you went about selecting. Um, I really like to work with 
people that I know. <laughs> so I mostly just used my friend's songs that I um, that I want to support, um, but also stuff that makes me move. So I um, there's two. There's one track. Um, Oh, this isn't for the street dance part, but there's one track by um, Menelon, which is two friends of mine in Toronto, and um, and I've been using it for over the last like six months or more, um, just in the studio, and it's stuff that just moves me. Mm -hmm. um, and the same with the other track, which is um, Kita and Brendan and Phillips, and I was, you know, in the studio and I need some inspiration, and that's what I dance to. Um, and sort of just in doing that, I, I have these songs that I like, that I'm really feeling for a certain amount of time, and then they come together and they work somehow. They're all very different, but <laughs> <laughs> they all come together. It's a really big, it shows, I think, my music, uh, <laughs> my eclectic music taste. Mm -hmm. And as far as the, the structure of the piece, uh, before starting the interview, you mentioned there, that, you know, and, and I, I could relate to this, to so not really feeling like, oh, this is, yeah, it's my piece, I, I created this piece. Um, so the, the improvisation element and what the dancers bring forward. Uh, when you recasted, how, how much did that change? Because I guess different dancers will yeah. kind of shift the piece in yeah. one way or another. Um, yeah, for sure. I mean, improvisation or freestyle, as we call it, and <laughs> it's the yeah. exact same thing. Um, uh, so our first show we had, the person that did a solo was more of a whacker. Okay. And then this time it was Jasmine, who has a bunch of styles. She can pretty much do anything she wants. Um, <laughs> she's fabulous. Um, and we had a b-boy for the first time for this show, so we didn't have... Uh, a b-boy before Jordan ready from the Yukon um, <laughs> so he's actually seen Sasquatches because he's from the Yukon um, <laughs> that's where they so all he, break. yeah he's like oh yeah they all break dance they're in my crew so then he started doing that um, so we had the b-boy for the first time and they do solo and then there's a little bit of choreography that they do all together um, that we kind of actually just added oh, when cool. we got here we were like, we need more dancing, so we, we added a, an extra house section. And what's the last thing you'd like to tell us about the Big Footed? Um, I, actually, I'd like to invite anybody that's listening to come to our show for free using the password SASK on the beach. So give a Sasquatch a chance with SASK <laughs> on the beach as a password. Yeah. So VJK, thank you so much for coming uh, in the studio with us. Thank you very much for having me. Okay, our next interview uh, incorporates that, that thing I mentioned at the beginning, how I have a weakness for puppets, and so we've ended up programming some, some puppet shows as part of the, uh, the Dirty Feet coverage of the St. Amboise Montreal Fringe Festival. Um, so we're going to be speaking with Anthony Maroda from uh, Naked Masks, and he's presenting the show Becoming Human, which was actually here at the festival last year in an earlier incarnation of the show. So uh, thank you for being here. Ah, thank you for having me. Hello. Great. So let's start at basic, as if uh, we've never heard of the show before. Okay. Can you tell us a bit about this, this puppet clowning spectacular you're putting together? <laughs> thank you for calling it spectacular. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's an exploration of masculinity using puppets and clowns and masks. Uh, kind of a modern day Pinocchio, uh, where a, a role model, if you will, suddenly inherits this puppet and teaches him how to be a boy and then transform into a man and offers him all the choices of what society offers for, for masculinity. Um, it's it's uh, got about let's see eight eight little puppets in it, uh, and just one performer, me, beside the puppets. That's charming to use, um, in essence, toys to to talk about manhood. It is. It's very playful, uh, and and there's a lot of just play in it, and how boys play, and what boys play with, and what boys maybe shouldn't play with, the taboos and stuff like that. And then, uh, you know, it it takes a turn, and, and I think becomes quite sweet by the end. Yeah. Both clowning and, and puppetry can yeah. be physical, so let's sure. try and tie that in. <laughs> yeah. Can I talk about, uh, or can I ask you to talk about your, your training a bit in, in clown? I, I was trained, at, at, trained in London at the London International School for Performing Arts, which is essentially a Lecoq school. Mm -hmm. uh, it teaches you very much uh, use of the body and physicality in telling stories. And so my background is a lot in masks and commedia dell'arte and clown. Uh, and uh, object theater, essentially, using objects to kind of express stuff. Mm -hmm. 
that's the word I got right now. <laughs> then with, with all these elements involved, how much uh, text or language is used in the work? Yeah, there's no text in this piece. Uh, there's a little bit of dialogue at the beginning in, a, in one of the media pieces. Um, but otherwise, it's, it's all just done through physicality. Um, again, the manipulation of the objects, the puppets. Uh, there's some pantomime going on, but no, there's no text. Um, so for those who are listening, uh, yeah. Anthony actually won the Spirit of the Fringe Award and was invited to come back, which is a great um, opportunity for you to kind of revisit the work, push it further. Yes. And um, uh, how, how much has it changed? You know, what's been great, I, this piece started out as a 10-minute piece at the Center for Puppetry Arts in Atlanta, and then... It moved to Montreal was its first kind of expanded, let's make it a full piece. And since that time, I've played a few other fringes and talked with a lot of artists and gone into workshops and just developed it a lot more. So it's, it's, I think it's a lot uh, crisper in its message, a lot more playful because now I'm more comfortable with a lot of what's going on and, and rehearsed it a bit more, uh, a lot more. Uh, and therefore, it's, it's, it's changed in the sense that I think... Uh, the questions that it asks are, are, are more poignant. Hmm. And the, the actual puppets that you're using. Yeah. So you have about seven puppets. I do. do. You, uh, do you work with somebody who builds them? Do you build them yourself? I, I build them myself. Uh, there are a bunch of masks and puppets uh, in here that, uh, again, have been worked and manipulated to a point where they, they can do what I need them to do when I need them to do that. So, so it was me working very intimately with them and then going back to the shop and adjusting a little bit. So it was, it was pretty much created by me, yeah. In the media recently, like in the past few years, there's been a lot of discussion about toys for kids and how gendered they should be. Right. Uh, there was uh, a lot of discussion about Lego, uh, the Lady Bic pens, yeah. which, which is ridiculous. Right. Um, <laughs> how important do you feel that we start ma giving a, a stronger direction for that conversation. Do you feel that, like, just having that conversation in I, the first place has become ridiculous? Because in the 70s, Legos were non gendered. Uh, right, more and I, more, they've started to do gender toys. Like, what exactly um, is your, your stance on that? Is a that fantastic discussion? question. It's exactly one of the questions of the piece. Uh, you know, some of this, a lot of this came from, I've got a, a five-year-old son now, and so I was developing this piece. It was those questions coming up all the time. It's, uh, yes, I want him to play with the fire trucks and the balls and all that stuff. But, no, of, of course he should be open to play with Barbie dolls. But, ooh, what if he's that kid playing Barbie dolls? So it's just a constant question, I think. We're posed. We're in this transitional period, I think, in gender identity where it's we don't know. And so I think this piece just poses that question. It doesn't particularly take a stand. It's it's more uh, let's look at the options. Uh, let's see what we could do. Let's recognize our own insecurities. And yeah, okay, play with that Barbie doll. I'm so uncomfortable with this, but I want you to be, you know, open. So it's just recognizing that discomfort that's still kind of there in our in our generation. But we are moving forward. So I, it's the best answer I can give. It's, 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 it's transitional at this point, I think. When, uh, when looking at topics such as these, especially with something that, that is physical mm -hmm. and, and not so much verbal or dialogue-y, um, it can be difficult sometimes to, to get to a discussion or get to a message without sounding either too preachy or the message just going over everyone's head. Yes. Uh, what was your strategy in creating a piece so that you could have that, uh, that a bit more objective mm -hmm. discourse, but still being a bit clearer about the, the topics that you're discussing? It, it's hard. This is one of the, the foundation principles of the, the Naked Mask Company is, is working with things that make the theater happen in the audience's mind, you know, present these things that raise the question. So it's, it's constantly a line. And yeah, I have so many opinions that I'd get to a point in the piece. I'm like, yeah, and then this is so evil. I'm like, no, back off. So I, I, I think I develop a segment and then I'd put my opinion in it and to end it. But then I eventually take that out so that it, every little segment comes to a point where it's, okay, here's just the information, and what are you going to do with it? What are you going to ask about it as an audience, and what can you take from it, if anything? And, and you're right, it's, 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 you know, as an artist, you have a lot of passions and things you want to say, but I, for me, the most exciting theater is, is what's being said in the audience's mind. So I, I think I, I struggle with that a lot. It's a terrific question, yeah. 
And it sounds as if the piece is very much meant to be to reach out to both kids and adults. I would, I, I, I seem to get the sense of. Is yeah, that... I'm not sure it's for kids. <laughs> I put 12 plus. So you know, it's 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 fine for kids. I'm not sure they'll get as much out of it. It's it's more designed. Uh, put I think 12 and over. Uh, there is a puppet circumcision that happens that I think might be traumatic for some younger kids. <laughs> yeah, it's exactly that. It's, you know, welcome to the world, puppet, you're a boy, hack, hack, hack. Uh, you know, it's stuff like that, but he does it with a smile and, you know, so it's... Uh, so I, no I, blood gushing on the stage? There's no blood gushing, oh. but, it, uh, you know... No, like uh, red silks just being pulled out of the well, tiny okay, penis? Well, okay, yes, actually it does happen. Not the penis, but there's later where a, a puppet gets hacked uh, and, and some blood gushes from the leg and the arm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, one of the, one of the puppets uh, is Real Man, and so Real Man goes to war and gets his leg shot off, and he's working with power tools and loses his arm, so there's, there's a little bit of violence, but, you know, it's, it's puppet violence. Was it at all influenced by the Black Knight from uh, Monty Python's Holy Grail? Uh, <laughs> that's Just great. a flesh wound. I hadn't thought about that. No, no. Uh, but he does kind of treat it like that, with that same attitude. Ah, it's just don't worry. I'll about just it. walk it off. Exactly. Fine. Exactly. Put this peg leg on. I'll move forward. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It, it's uh, again. It's done with a puppet smile and, and a wink to the audience. So you're left thinking, well, isn't that? bad that he just lost a leg but he's smiling so it's uh, but no I, I i wouldn't put it in the children's puppetry category i'm not, i'm not quite there <laughs> okay the fringe uh well i mean obviously you got the spirit of the fringe award uh, last yeah. year. so you're doing something right about the fringe what exactly for you is the importance uh when you come to the fringe when you're presenting your piece like how do you approach your fringe experience oh i, I mean especially in a, a a community like I found here in Montreal, the, the artistic community is just so willing to play and participate and ask questions. And, you know, after every show, I, you know, there's usually five or six people who stop and ask me questions. It's just something about that spirit of we know you're an artist trying to say something. And so I love this idea that, you know, it's not like a typical audience. I can ask questions and, and get some honest feedback and, and, develop the piece further so it's it's this nice kind of loop of of artistry that goes around in communities like this and other fringes yeah great so this was t anthony uh, morada to talk to us about becoming human a uh, puppet becomes a man but what kind and that w you're performing at the theatre um, studio jean valcourt right right exactly perfect mm -hmm. so everyone can look up the uh, the schedule on the fringe website obviously Thank you so much. Thank Stan you for having Marata. me. It's been fantastic. Thank you. Good to meet you. Up next, we're going to stay on the, the theme of clowning uh, for the uh, company Box of Clowns. They're presenting the show Mom, with a question mark, a comedy of mourners. And uh, we actually have three guests representing this company that's all the way from Portland, Oregon, uh, to um, yeah, talk about the show. So we've got Jeff, Laura, and Anna. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. So you guys have been, uh, been creating work with Box of Clowns for a while now, as far as I understand. Can you tell me a bit about the company? Sure. Uh, we all trained at the Delarte School of Physical Theater. In We graduated 2013 from the one-year program. And actually, the final project that we did uh, was 10 minutes long, and we decided that we wanted to continue working on it. So two years later, we have a 50-minute piece, and we're a full-fledged company. Yeah, and it's real. We're an LLC. That makes us official. I don't know what they have in Canada, but that just means that we file taxes. <laughs> <laughs> Legitimacy. Okay, great. Um, and can you tell us about uh, why you chose to come to the Montreal Fringe Festival with the show? Well, we got in, which was super exciting. Um, I'm particularly excited to bring our show to the East part of North America. Um, I'm from southern New Hampshire, not too far from here, so it's really exciting for me to bring my work back closer to home um, for this. And also, um, Montreal, of course, is just known for its clowning and its circus, so it's very exciting to perform here in the home of Cirque du Soleil and all these um, greats in our field. You have a you have a note that there is some English dialogue in the show, but but also that it's minimal. So it's largely physical what you guys are doing on stage, yeah. Very much so. So the a brief description of our show is clowns suspended in air. 
They're teetering on the edge of this very small set. It's about seven feet long, maybe two, two and a half feet wide. They three. do meters here. <laughs> no. Just under three meters long. There you go. I was so confused there for a bit. <laughs> Thank you, thank you so much. But it's also um, elevated off of the floor, and we only stay in this space. So there's a lot of acrobatics, there's a lot of slapstick, um, and yeah, there's a lot of trust. A lot of trust. <laughs> but we are um, three clown siblings, and we're spreading the ashes of our mother. But we're really bad at it, because <laughs> we're clowns. <laughs> and actually, we did just add two lines in French. It's a surprise. Bilingual. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> it's like organic products, right? When they have like 5% of organic products. Yes, exactly. This is an organic <laughs> product. Glu gluten free clowning. <laughs> <laughs> and it is actually gluten free, is the funny thing. <laughs> so you mentioned that the in the show, three siblings spreading the ashes of their mother. Um, where does the, that come from? Is this a personal experience? Uh, or, you know, it really, it really just came from character work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so stupid. This piece came originally because we had ten different suitcases we were carting around with us, and we had to decide what is in each suitcase. And one of them just we decided was a garden, and it was a dead garden, and it had belonged to Frank's mother. That's my clown, and so his mother had passed away. This was just something that happened um and so wherever we got the suitcase he had to take out a flower and leave it there and he never wanted to and it kind of became like this bit where the the suitcase would open he'd cry and it would close and he'd be, be okay mm -hmm. but it was uh we did it uh for our classmates and it was really effective and so we pared it down to one suitcase and yeah took it from there and our company, um, also with this piece, we strive to find humor and unexpected places. Um, and death is, um, especially in our Northern American cultures, uh, is, is a very difficult thing, especially to talk about, to mm -hmm. deal with. Um, and so we strive to make it more of an open conversation. Yeah, and the other thing is that um, because um, our company works, our, our method works from our characters, and all of our creation comes from characters, so um, it's sort of a genderless theater. We go, we do not, we're not going into this saying, we're going to say this about death. Yeah, so when, when the audience sees it, they're going to think this A, B, C about death. We're going to go in there, and we're going to be characters, and people are going to see these characters going through, in this case, a funeral, and then the audience will see whatever they see in that. So people laugh. I mean, once we performed this, and this woman had just lost um, a nephew, no, her, her grandson had just died in a car crash, and she ended up like having to leave the theater. She was bawling her eyes out, but I think it was she really enjoyed it. She came back in at the end and was clapping, and was like, it was a very powerful experience for her. Um, that being said, it's funny. It is funny. <laughs> really funny. <laughs> We, yeah, we like to say it's a clown show that you can cry at and a funeral that you can laugh at. How much of uh, the artist therapeutic model do you, do you guys uh, take in? Do you, do you feel that in this case, like you know, people who are going through mourning or who have a difficult time accepting death should see the show just so that it can be, you know what, like, yeah, let's, yeah, let's just mean, deal with this. Y yes, we didn't make this show in order to spread a message. But after two years of working on it, we can retrospectively say, it, at the end of the day, it, it's about these characters and they mourn in whatever way that they need to. And so I think it lets audiences know it's okay to feel silly or stupid or whatever when you lose someone. You, you, know, you have your own journey. And to see you know, these characters uh, lose someone and go through everything that in the audience goes through and let us know that Uh, you might feel like you might die. You might feel, you know, oh, Laura really wants to say something. So. Oh. It's just that um, my favorite part about doing the show is the stories that people tell us after the show. And so many people have hilarious stories about spreading ashes, like ridiculous things. Like they sneak into these places in Europe, like old cathedrals, and they like, sneak in behind the guards. And when they're not looking, dump the ashes behind someone else's grave. And it's, it's really bizarre. What's up, Jim Morrison? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's ridiculous the things people will do with ashes. It's just carbon, but you know. Yeah. <laughs> 
I guess my favorite after story or after show story was um, actually happened on a boat. Uh, this woman was there. She was on the the, the prow, the front, and um, she was there. And there was a bunch of people behind her. And she takes the ashes, and almost like that Titanic moment where they're in the very end. And she throws it in, and then the wind comes in and brings it all back in everyone else's faces. <laughs> 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 yeah, we get stories like that all the time. Yeah. I'd like to hear one more story. Anyone has? I a- actually do have one. <laughs> We actually performed this show on a small cruise ship because I was working on it last summer. <laughs> we did it for the crew. And um, the engineer came up to me and he's like, you know, when I, I lost my mother, I had to do the eulogy and I brought out the urn and I spilled it. And so then I brought out a little dust buster. Do you have dust busters in Canada? A little vacuum. And he, he vacuums it up. and So we had staged the whole thing. But, like, you know, it, it's the same deal. It's You have to be able to find joy in these experiences. She loved vacuuming. <laughs> <laughs> Mom. So if you're if you're ready to laugh about death, uh, you can come see Mom, a comedy of mourners by Box of Clowns, uh, playing at the Montreal Fringe Festival uh, all the way from Portland. So thank you, Anna, Laura, and Jeff for joining us. Thank, thank you so you. much. Uh, next up, we're gonna we're gonna switch gears and talk about a theater piece. Uh, it's called "Displaced" by Ground Cover Theater, and it's there. Uh, the company's all the way from Saskatoon, and uh, this this show I, I don't know too too much about it except that it was uh, it's it's about three women who are immigrants um, from different periods in time, and and also that at the thirteenth hour the other night, you guys did a, a wonderful Irish. <laughs> Uh, song for for the crowd. And Thank it was, you. It was great. Um, so perhaps uh, let's flesh out quickly what the show is all about. Sure. Um, so kind of the idea of the show is uh, these past generations sowing the seeds for future generations to thrive in Canada, and we kind of tell that through um, interweaving storytelling, uh, original music by uh, Jason Cullimore, who's nominated for a Gemini. Um, and physical theater. So kind of the idea that we're all immigrants to this country, you know, except for the the Aboriginal people who are obviously absolutely here first. But it's also this uh, female narrative of immigration. Um, From, like you said, three different periods of Canadian history, 1847. uh, Mary comes from uh, the Irish famine, which took almost two million lives, if you can imagine. and my character, Sophia, fleeing war-torn Germany in 1947, and uh, Dara fleeing uh, Afghanistan in 2007. And of course, this is Anna Mazurik, yeah. <laughs> who's, uh, who's answering. I did not introduce you earlier. I apologize. <laughs> hey, guys. So within, within the context of the show, can you tell us what, uh, what movement uh, you have going on? What kind of movement we have going on? Um, well, we're, we're, we're moving to this music that was composed for us, uh, and it kind of just helps to um, show the, the struggles and the pains of adapting <clears throat> excuse me, to these unfamiliar customs. And the way that we explored that was through uh, different practices, so lots of like Laban, uh, so we're looking at gestures and shape and Anne Bogart's um, viewpoint sessions. These are all movement terminologies. Uh, body-mind centering was a big thing for us. And, uh, yeah, we actually all looked at our, our histories, too. So where our families all come from, because so much of our histories are, are really mixed. So I'm like Austrian, Dutch Mennonite, Norwegian, Swedish. And uh, it was important for us to look uh, at where our families came from, too, to help motivate uh, our own personal um, connections to the story, I guess. So these techniques that you're talking about, is this part of the the research of the show? And uh, It was part of the rehearsal process, and then it, call, it also informed the choreography that we, that we use in the show. For, so, I mean, for example... Um, something with like uh, Laban is uh, we looked at um, movement, making a gesture, and then from that gesture, 
uh, finding an objective. So, for example, I do this one move with a violin, and my I found an objective with that, which is I need to forgive my husband, Julius, who deserted me. Um, and we actually in, incorporate that into the, the choreography of the show. So... And the, as far as the choreography goes, um, I may have missed, uh, maybe this is not right, but uh, it was Natasha who, who d- did the movement, or how did yeah. that, or were you guys a part of the process? How did that? We uh, were a big part of the process. Uh, Natasha had an idea of how, how she wanted things to come to fruition and what, mm-hmm. they, what she wanted them to look like, but it was a lot of us going with our impulses and, and characters. Um, and yeah, so we re- only rehearsed this for three weeks, actually. And in the mornings, we would do movement rehearsal and and kind of explore these things and improvise. And then we started integrating those into the uh, choreography sections of the of the play. Hmm. <laughs> Someone thought that uh, the the name of our show was disgraced. It was funny. Uh-huh. Which, it works too. Which is actually a funny assumption to make about three women Mm -hmm. to to say disgrace because that that would be a term that would be more automatically applied to women Mm -hmm. i feel this idea of disgrace and yeah tradition and you know uh but we've had a we've had a really uh we've had a small turnout but a really positive turnout so far and uh we actually got um a scout from Cirque du Soleil who gave us her card which was really cool and someone else who was like i've been going to the fringe for 20 years and this is this is one of the best I've seen. It was like, wow, that's a huge compliment. This is only like the first couple times we've actually done it for an audience. The show hasn't been up on its feet before this fringe. So, um, we, yeah, we're having a very positive response so far. Positive, but small response. So what, what made you decide, uh, you know, all the way from Saskatoon to premiere this show over here in Montreal? Um, well, we wanted to get the show on its feet, and what better way to try out shows than the Fringe Festival? And um, so, yeah, like we just put our names in the in the lottery system, and then we got Montreal and Saskatoon, and we're on the waiting list for Toronto, but that's not going to happen because we're at the very bottom, <laughs> and that's coming up pretty quick. <laughs> yeah. So, I also wanted to ask when you were talking about the different, you know looking back at the different heritages of, of the mm-hmm. of the characters were you were you looking into the traditional dances of these of these countries um yeah natasha did more of the um research on that we just had a such a short amount of rehearsal time to cover such a huge subject for each of these characters but she did look at uh dance uh, we actually incorporate like an irish jig into it so like uh, like at the 13th hour the other night, we had that Irish drinking song. We have something a little bit like that, just a little bit more drunk and sad. Um, and we also have like a traditional Afghan dance. And uh, nothing from my character, but um, she had researched uh, sort of German dancing, Jewish dancing as well. We've been speaking with Anna Mazurek from ground cover theater and they're presenting the the theater piece displaced uh here at the fringe uh thank you very much for joining us thank you so much so next up we're going to talk about a lovely little show that i discovered in uh, victoria last summer and that now we finally get to uh, have here in montreal called oni it's an adult shadow puppetry comedy from japan um, yeah, I was kind of blown away when I saw this show. I was, I didn't know what oh, to wow, expect, thank you. uh, expect, sorry, I didn't know what to expect. I, as far as the, the overall, um, production, the structure of the show, did you guys create it, uh, together or is it, and is this a new collaboration? Have you guys worked together before? Yeah. Yeah, we've been working together for about three years since we met at Puppetry School. I guess Oni was our third show, yeah, full-length show that we did together. And yeah, uh, we collaborate, we talk everything through. Sari's kind of an expert on Japanese folk tales, and we thought it'd be fun to do a show where she speaks Japanese and I translate and kind of mess everything up. Yeah, and also we take some um, really famous folk tales and Daniel changes it into a bit more sexy and dirty, funny show <laughs> using my puppet. 
We figured that these were the kinds of folk tales that adults would sort of tell each other late night yeah. at an izakaya after yeah. drinking a long time, having a bit of sake and, and telling some sexy folk tales. <laughs> and as far as making the actual puppets, who, who does that? Who does the cutouts and the design and the... Because there are a lot of details, very particular details. Oh, thank you. I make, I design and make puppets and then cut out too. But in particular, see the um, designs and make puppets. Yeah, I was making some shadow puppets before I met Sari, but hers are, are much nicer. So we mostly use her designs. <laughs> Um, and there's uh, there's not only you know the the puppetry but also the um, different lighting effects and uh, and music interludes. Um, as far as that structure kind of going back and forth from them and and the kind of dirty element of of of, of uh, I guess not necessarily sex jokes but very sexual content. Um, how. I think basically, usually a puppet show, we're kind of like, oh, it could be for kids. And mm. how has how have you been able to integrate this piece in the in breaking those those stereotypes? Well, we're not the first people to do a dirty puppetry show. Of course, <laughs> there's lots of them, but but dirty puppetry shows always seem to go sort of in the more vulgar direction. We wanted to do it in a more classy way, you know, not just making puppets. <laughs> you know, swear and fart, but actually really arousing the audience in a humorous way. With some very white playing. Yeah. We really want to set an atmosphere that'll, that'll get people in the mood, you know. How do you prepare to do this type of show? Is it, um, since we are a movement-based podcast, um, I'm very interested in maybe the movement that you got moving from one puppet to another and, and the there's a lot of organization in this show. There's a lot of changes, a lot of different yeah. things coming up. How do you organize yourself and get ready before a show for that to all be in place? Well, Sari has the puppets that she uses in her little piles, and I make my little piles on the stage, and we, we kind of organize in our own different ways. Yeah, but sometimes we have to share a puppet, and sometimes Dan puts it in a bit far away, and I have trouble getting it and <laughs> uh, yeah she does that to me too sometimes she'll put the puppet I need like right behind her and I'll be like mm. so then I just try to talk a little bit slower and more sexy and uh, give us time to yeah. hand the puppets to each other <laughs> make a joke <laughs> he's good at, at giving so. so there's a lot of reaching going on in the show <laughs> yeah and it's the kind of show where if we if we make some mistakes it it just it just helps us bond with the audience and yeah, makes it, it more personal. It, yeah, it, it's it's very charming those moments. Thank you. Yeah. Can we hear a little bit of that music interlude? I see you have your recording. Sure. With you. I know I know it's a podcast, but I also brought the flashlight to, to have the puppets dance to the uh the music. I'll do the description. So um the light is turned on and shined towards the wall. And Lady Gaga takes the center stage. <laughs> Moving our hands up and down, <laughs> turning around, getting bigger and smaller. I was not expecting that. <laughs> I, I hope that doesn't create any copyright issues for you on your show. I think it's all right. Um, the graphic on your on on your flyer is that is that also you? Yeah, I messed it. Like I just cut papers and layered it with um, different colors. But this it's the same method. Of, um, the shadow puppets I'm making, and this is kind of a traditional way to make pu shadow puppets in Japan. Oh, wow. So every line and everything you see is just paper that she cut out and layered on top of each other for yeah. that picture. 
So for those who are listening, I know you can't see um, these puppets, but they are quite beautiful and it's worth uh, going Thank to you. check Thank out. Um, so we were speaking to the wonderful creators of Oni, which is an adult uh, shadow puppetry comedy from Japan. Uh, it's playing at the Montreal Fringe, of course, in venue for the Studio Circus. Um, and you can check out the website for the dates at montrealfringe.ca. Uh, Thanks. Thank, Thank you. you very much. All right, up next, we've got two lovely international artists um, that we're really excited about. We have Yanomi and Baron here with us, um, who seem to know each other already, which is quite lovely to see. Um, and uh, Baron is uh, performing an off show at the Wiggle Room, uh, which is uh, Baron Vaudeville on the Rocks. And uh, Yanomi is uh, performing a lovely little show called Kiss Around, Pass Around. Um, for any of you who've seen the around the Fringe Festival. They're very colorful and animated and uh, often in costume. Uh, and it's, it's a really lovely element that's added on to uh, the Fringe world of things. Uh, so let's jump right into th this. Uh, I know that you are doing two very different uh, shows. Um, however, there seems to be quite a common ground when it comes to uh, performing something that is embodied or a character that kind of takes over uh as far as developing the character that you're you're performing in your show how did you go about uh creating that character hi um i'm baron and i do a vaudeville um i met vaudeville i, I remember the first time was when i watched the charlie chaplin when i was 10 years old maybe and he sang he performed he danced did everything on the screen and that amazed me and I then I got interested in comedy and music so much I was when I was in high school and university I was doing music all the time but uh, then I wanted to do more then I joined the pantomime company and learn all sorts of um, other expressions. And that's how I became Vaudevillian. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very interesting. I put everything into my show. Yeah. Mm, which is very unique <laughs> for me. Yeah. Mm. It makes show very unique. Variety. Mm -hmm. yeah. What about you, Yanomi? Mm. Hi, it's Yanomi, aka Shoshins. Uh, my show, Kiss Around, Pass Around, uh, the character is a, a little kid, but it's not the human, maybe the, the mysterious creature wandering the world. So my previous show, Miss Hiccup, uh, she was an old lady living alone in her home. So then next show, uh, Kiss Around, Pass Around, I wanted to create uh, something totally different from that character. So I chose the little kid, very cheerful and naughty and not very educated. So uh, that character can explore the world uh, through the adventure. And it's, uh, there's a lot of interaction with the audience. So I use... Uh, so much physical expression because that character is so little so that character cannot speak very well so it's more like relies on the body expression and as far as the um the movement of this cute uh, naughty you know little girl uh, how not girl. not girl not boy not girl not boy nobody no gender. knows Nobody no knows. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> um, how did you, uh, what was your research like to, to, to figure out the physicality of that character? Basically, I, I like to watch all those children in the world. And then I love the way they move or like how, how they play around the, the, the out of the, like out of sight, uh, outside or inside. And they always, they were like, they were always excited to find something new, right? Like they never, they never seen 
a like tiny little insect or anything like ocean or like rain or everything uh, they were always surprised and it's so excited and sometimes scared so I, I always like to watch them and also I like the the those nature things like insect birds or those move movement so yeah that's my kind of research <laughs> research um, Baron in your show there is such clarity in your miming there's you create whole scenes just just with your your body and it's very um it must be precise to 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 give a give the effect that you're you're going for and it's it's incredible how well you do that mm -hmm. how how do you even begin to 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 work that way pantomime mm, how <laughs> Well, I watched a lot of shows before I started, and um, I think I watched good ones, very good ones, in Japan. And I went, before I started this, I think ten, almost 10 years ago, I went to Edinburgh Fest uh, Fringe, mm -hmm. and I saw very good shows there. And those inspired me to make what I make now. And... And yeah, and my pantomime teacher was very strict. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the moves, and he he taught me not only the move, the moves. Oh, no, I mean, not only the physical um, movement, but also the emotional movement, and that's more important to create um, are you scene, talking about scene, yeah. expression expression yeah, yeah. Yes, 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 yes yeah now both of you create highly physical works uh, which which opens a door for you to, to, to do things like come to come to Montreal and I know Yanomi you've been across Canada as well um, what came first did you did you realize that you had that asset with working with very physical work and begin touring or was it because you were interested in 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 spreading your your art further that you started physically researching work uh, as for me i started my original show in a small bar in tokyo and then the owner was british guy who didn't speak english uh, not japanese so then i started to do my show without any languages so then he could understand my show and also his customer uh, who were from foreign countries could understand my show so then i started my tour tour uh in in many other different countries so it's like uh starting in the in the like by coincidentally and then now it's it's working in many other countries because of the physicality not very language based so that's my history. Mm, well, I want to go overseas, overseas. I wanted to spread. I wanted to meet new people. I wanted to see more uh, exciting shows. Um, what I see is what I. What I see uh, is becomes basic of what I make. So, mm, that's why I'm here, Montreal. <laughs> yeah. Uh, humor, even through uh, physical comedy, is still going to be very culturally ingrained. It's, it's going to be very cultural mm -hmm. humor. Um, how easy do you find it to adapt your type of comedy to audiences around the world? Do you find that you don't have much to change? Or do you find that Japanese-style comedy is going to have big differences that you need to adapt for people in different countries? For me, um doesn't make big difference. Well, there is a language difference and the attitude difference of audience. Uh, I think Japanese audience are um, a bit shy to express their um, reactions. Um, and the Montreal people go crazy. 
<laughs> very, react very quickly. But um, what I don't uh, think, if I do a good show, both are happy and both audience are happy and they give us good reactions. Um, so in that mm -hmm. sense, I don't find any difference. Mm. Yeah. So in my show, I do many interaction with the audience. So when I did my show in Japan, um, most of the people like uh, felt like I have to be polite to this actor, or like I have to do the the right thing, so not the wrong things. So they're like sometimes afraid of making a mistake. But you know, there's there's no mistakes in the theater, right? You can do anything. And then also when I ask. Uh, the character, my character asks something to the audience, uh, Japanese people mostly couldn't deny it. But here in Montreal, some audience can like say, no, no, I cannot do that. So it's really uh, interesting to me. So everybody has a different reaction, so they can choose. But most of the Japanese people are like, try to be nice and try to be right. So it's a big difference to me. Does it make make it complicated for you with Japanese audiences to not go over the limit like feeling oh well I can make them do that because they're so polite but I shouldn't because it's not really nice to put them in that position do you ever want like worry about that uh, yeah I have to concern a little bit about it because I don't want to make people feel bad or like feel disappointed so and uh, I, I try not to uh, not to be too offensive, but I try to be naughty because, like, it's a kid, and also like to ask many things to the audience so they can try something really new for them. Them, so they never done that before in front of the people or in the theater. So I really try them to experience something new. So, but uh, yeah, it's it's also really fun and inspiring to. In, a, in a both ways. And Yanomi, you went from uh, an older woman to now a, a genderless child of mm -hmm. unknown uh, ethnicity and origin. After that, are you just going to tackle the, like, do a, a boring office worker <laughs> sitting at his desk with the most bland life ever? <laughs> <laughs> ah, I have no plan for next, but uh, that's um, maybe one of the good ideas, good suggestions for me. I'll be waiting for my check. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, I will send you someday. And um, we've mentioned before the episode, you seem to know each other from Japan before. Yes, yes. In which kind of environment did you meet the two of you? How did you know each other? Is it from like a cabaret scene in Japan or? Yeah, cabaret... And theaters, More theater, right? maybe ten years ago. Mm. Yeah, yeah. We, you, you know, Cherry Typhoon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's a burlesque dancer, Japanese burlesque dancer, and she. We've had her on the podcast before. Good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> Cherry Typhoon is our mutual friend. So uh, that's how we met, and we worked together. Um, we made shows together, mm. and this time we are different doing d different shows yeah mm. we know very well each other and we drink beer a lot yeah we drink a lot together <laughs> <laughs> that's the most important point so Baron and uh, Yanomi thank you so much for coming on the show today so just to remind everyone Baron you're performing at the Wiggle Room yeah. and uh, Yanomi you're performing at the Mainline, the Mainline Theater yeah, right yeah. here where we're recording from uh, so everyone can find your schedule on the website and I think we'll leave off with a quick song by Baron We are singing in the rain We are singing in the rain We came for the interview by it's raining, it's raining so much. We are wet, we are wet, we are wet. I hope you're listening to this. Oh, 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 o
Please come see Baron's Bolivar on the rocks. He's amazing. He can do everything. He can tap. <laughs> and come see my show. Kiss around, pass around. It's a bizarre adventure. You're gonna love it. Come see the show. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for coming on, eh? Le prochainement, euh, on a Liliane Moussa avec nous pour parler de sa pièce finale au sol, euh, une pièce de danse évidemment dans, dans notre festival. Euh, donc euh, bonjour, bon matin. Merci, <rire> Merci bon d'être là. Merci d'être avec nous. Euh, donc on va tout de suite commencer à parler de euh, par rapport au, au le concept du spectacle. Vraiment pour ceux pour leur donner euh, un aperçu de, de ce qu'ils s'attendent à quoi quand qu ils rentrent voir le spectacle pour la première fois. Euh, ben, final au sol, c'est euh, quatre solos qui mm -hmm. s'enchaînent. Euh, c'est euh, une pièce qui s'inspire de mes euh, souvenirs d'enfance euh, dans le monde de la gymnastique, parce que j'ai fait beaucoup de gymnastique quand j'étais jeune. Puis j'ai voulu reprendre la forme d'une compétition de gymnastique en faisant quatre solos euh, pour aborder euh, des thèmes sportifs, mais c'est ça, des, en fait, chacune des interprètes euh, a beaucoup de force puis de puissance dans ce qu'elle fait, mais elles incarnent aussi une faiblesse qui se rattache au monde du sport. Euh, mm -hmm. Fait qu'elles ont chacun un petit côté plus euh, faible, là, dans le fond, oui. <rire> Puis, il euh, y a quand même des noms qu'on qu reconnaît. Il y a Anne-Flore euh, qui, qui a fait une pièce au Fringe justement oui. avant. Euh, comment t'as fait pour sélectionner tes interprètes? C'est des gens avec qui t'as déjà travaillé? Euh, oui, euh, pour la majorité. Je fais déjà une co-création avec Anne-Flore qu'on euh, mm -hmm. qu diffuse... Euh, on est off, là, présentement. Euh, puis Marine aussi est dans cette pièce-là. Puis Marilyn, ben je collabore avec elle depuis le bac euh, à l'UCAM, donc je la connais bien et j'avais envie de travailler avec elle à nouveau. Liane, c'est la première fois que je travaille avec elle, mais je la connais du bac aussi à l'UCAM. Mais elle a présenté aussi un solo euh, dans la dernière année, puis j'avais aimé euh, sa performance, donc je me suis dit que j'allais la sélectionner pour euh, ben, la prendre pour faire... Euh, un, un autre solo. <rire> Puis les solos, ils ont vraiment été créés avec les interprètes. Oui, j'ai travaillé euh, toute seule avec elles, avec chacune d'elles euh, pendant comme trois semaines chacune. Puis ensuite, on s'est rencontrés pour euh, se montrer, dans le fond, qu'est-ce qui avait été fait euh, en solo avec chacune d'elles. Puis c'était euh, super intéressant parce que tout ce qu'on a construit en studio, les autres ne l'avaient pas vu. Donc la première fois qu'on s'est rencontrés, il y avait vraiment comme un élément de stress qui faisait très compétitif, là, les, mes danseuses se justifiaient, ils étaient « ah ben là, euh, moi j'ai eu moins de temps, euh, ma musique est pas prête euh, », il y avait vraiment comme un élément de stress, puis on était seulement juste en studio, c'était très relax, mais <rire> elles se sont comme infligées <rire> un stress qui était vraiment intéressant de voir. Là. Et euh, Simon Girard c'est oui. la première fois que tu travailles avec lui pour la conception sonore? Euh, non, c'est la troisième fois. Il a fait ma musique pour euh, le, mon spectacle final du bac à Lucam. Puis euh, pour euh, quand j'avais présenté à Springboard en 2012. Euh, Simon, il a aussi fait de la gymnastique. Là, on, se, ben, okay. on se connaît, on se côtoie depuis qu'on est tout jeune. Là. Lui faisait beaucoup de gymnastique compétitive. Mais euh, c'est pas pour ça que je l'ai choisi, là. C'est juste parce que j'aime euh, ce qu'il fait. Il fait de la musique électronique. OK. C'est une collaboration qui a commencé quand exactement? Euh, en 2011. 2011? Oui. Donc, c'est quelqu'un que tu fais confiance par oui, rapport à oui. ça? Oui, puis il est super. Il s'adapte vraiment à, à mes demandes. T'sais, je lui demande quelque chose, puis même si c'est pas tellement clair, on dirait qu'il comprend. Fait qu'il y a comme une belle communication. C'est le fun. Puis, euh, par rapport au fringe, euh, c'est quand même une réalité un peu différente que avoir mettons, euh, deux jours pour l'installation, mm -hmm. puis prendre le temps d'être dans l'espace. Euh, avec 15 minutes d'installation au début, euh, en tant que compagnie de danse, c'est quand même quelque chose de pouvoir se réchauffer et tout. Mm -hmm. euh, comment avez-vous, mettons, tout le monde les interprète, et toi aussi en tant que... Euh, régisseuse <rire> pour caler le show. Comment vous faites pour vous préparer dans, dans peu de temps? Euh, 
Ben, les interprètes euh, louent, ben, louent des studios là, ou vont dans des studios avant la représentation. Puis, donc, elles arrivent, sont déjà échauffées. Puis, tout ça fait que dans le 15 minutes qu'on a avant l'entrée du public, c'est surtout juste comme de, de les habituer à l'éclairage de scène un peu pour pas qu'elles soient comme éblouies trop. Puis, euh, je les laisse vraiment se préparer euh, tout seul. Là, c'est vraiment comme... Euh, je me sens un peu comme un coach. Là, la job est faite. Fait qu'ils arrivent, puis... Avec le thème tour. de sport, C'est ça. C'est à leur tour de performer. Fait que moi, je suis là. Je prépare mes cues. Les autres, ils font leur, euh, mm -hmm. leur truc. On, on installe la scène qui est pas très compliqué Puis, puis y a-tu ouais, oui. des thèmes spécifiques qui, qui ressortent dans, dans, dans chaque solo? Oui, ben, chacune d'elles, je me suis comme inspirée de leur personnalité pour faire ressortir puis exagérer un, un trait. C'est la première fois que je fais de la danse qui, euh, avec des interprètes qui incarnent un personnage. Mm -hmm. C'est un petit peu plus théâtral. Je n'avais pas fait ça euh, avant. Donc, euh, c'est ça, je me suis inspirée de leur, soit de leur physicalité ou de leur personnalité pour faire un spectacle. Donc, j'en ai, euh, ai une qui est vraiment tu sais, super grande. Anne-Flore a une, une physique qui est assez particulier et beau. <rire> Donc, euh, Anne-Flore, elle incarne un peu le, le corps imaginaire qu'on se fait de l'athlète, puis la, la, la femme bionique, si on mm -hmm. peut dire, dans, dans son solo. Euh, Marine, elle, euh, je trouve que c'est quelqu'un qui est très maternel, donc euh, j'ai voulu, euh, elle, elle vit par procuration un peu euh, ce qui se passe devant elle pendant le spectacle, fait que c'est comme soit une spectatrice, un coach ou quelque chose comme ça qui vit, puis qui, qui est très empathique par rapport à une genre de performance sportive qui se passe devant. Euh, puis sinon, j'ai Marilyn, elle, qui, euh, qui se nourrit du regard des autres, puis de l'approbation des autres, fait qu'elle est très, très euh, à la recherche euh, c'est ça, de, du, du regard des autres pendant son solo. Puis Liane, elle, c'est un petit peu comme euh, une éternelle débutante. Là. Elle se fait pas confiance. Elle est très... Euh, euh, elle, est comme, elle est là, mais elle s'assume pas. Elle veut pas vraiment être là tout à fait. Puis euh, c'est comme si, euh, même si elle est talentueuse, elle, elle sent pas qu'elle a sa place dans cette compétition-là. Donc euh, c'est comme les quatre personnages qu'on a créés euh, au travers de la création. Puis un peu des, des sentiments vécus peut-être dans, dans le passé oui. par rapport à la compétition et tout. Oui, c'est vraiment des images que j'avais, de, 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 des souvenirs là, qui, sont, qui ont émergé mm -hmm. de moi. Puis j'ai aussi beaucoup lu sur le sport euh, pendant la création. C'est euh, un livre de Denis Moreau qui s'appelle « Exercice... Euh, » Je me rappelle plus du titre et exercice spirituel. Activité physique et exercice spirituel. Mmh. C'est des essais philosophiques sur euh, le sport. Donc, euh, c'est vraiment intéressant de voir comment ils réfléchissent le sport. Puis, ça a donné beaucoup de des citations là, qui étaient vraiment révélatrices, qui ont nourri les, les solos. Mmh. Puis, au niveau des interprètes, euh, bon, ils ont leur personnalité sur laquelle tu t'es basé, mais ils viennent toutes. Vous venez toutes, en fait, de l'UQAM. Oui. Vous avez probablement eu tout le même background. Vous avez été des années assez proches l'une de l'autre. Oui. Euh, fait qu'au niveau de l'entraînement le, physique, la physicalité, l'esthétisme, vous aviez tout de même des, des ressemblances probablement assez fortes. Euh, Est-ce que tu as, as senti qu'à travers le travail, euh, l'une après l'autre, tu as vraiment pu euh, les amener dans des directions différentes au niveau de la fiscalité? Est-ce que toi-même, tu sens que ta signature est restée très présente dans chacune des quatre, euh, chacun des quatre solos? Euh, je pense que ma signature est présente dans chacun des quatre solos. C'est une gestuelle qui est très physique, qui demande... On n'est pas dans la, la minimisation de l'effort du tout. C'est euh, de l'effort qui est parfois efficace. Là, fait que parfois, elle se déplace avec euh, l'effort qu'elle produit, mais souvent, c'est de l'effort inefficace. Donc, elle force, mais ça produit produit pas grand chose. Euh, fait que ça, je, ça fait partie de, de mon travail. Euh, Puis c'est certain que pour celles qui avaient déjà travaillé avec moi, c'était un petit peu plus euh, facile à intégrer dans leur corps. Euh, mais c'est ça. Il y en a qui ont, comme par exemple Anne Flore, on est vraiment différentes dans notre façon de bouger et dans nos qualités physiques. Mais on a travaillé pour qu'elle intègre, dans le fond, un petit peu plus euh, majestuelle. Mais c'est certain que je me suis comme inspirée de leur corps puis de, de leur force. Là, puis de leur... Oui. Toi, tu avais eu Daniel Leveillé comme prof, je pense. Oui. À quel point est-ce que tu sens que ça a été euh, un moment tournant, en fait, dans 
ton, ta propre approche chorégraphique, est-ce que tu sens que tu même une ressemblance un peu avec son travail? Euh, non, <rire> je ne dirais pas ça. Parce qu'au niveau des, des éléments, tu parlais, c'est mm -hmm. très semblable d'un point de vue superficiel, en tout cas. Oui. Est-ce que tu sens, de, de quelle façon est-ce que tu sens que ça va chercher autre chose? Bien, da Daniel Léveillé, c'est surtout comme un... Il nous a comme vraiment nourri plus au niveau de la pensée, là, de comment penser de façon critique notre travail. Là. Je pense que c'est surtout là-dedans qu'il nous influence parce que il, il intervenait pas vraiment euh, au niveau de notre esthétique. Là. Dans le fond, on choisit euh, l'esthétique, puis chaque euh, créateur a sa façon de faire, puis son esthétique. Mais euh, c'est plus au niveau de la pensée critique par rapport à notre travail que je pense que Daniel Éveillé a été vraiment comme un un point euh, important là, du, de la formation à l'UQAM. Puis toi, à travers ce, ce besoin d'effort de, sur scène, euh, cette esthétique-là esthétique qui est plus dans le, la fiscalité brute, je sais, mm -hmm. euh, qu'est-ce qui t'intéresse dedans? Qu'est-ce qui t'amène vers ces directions-là? Euh, euh, on dirait juste que c'est incarné dans moi. <rire> ça doit être à cause de la gymnastique, là, parce que c'est tellement tout le temps force maximale là, quand on s'entraîne. C'est chaque fois qu'on fait quelque chose, c'est toujours dans la force maximale, c'est toujours comme dans la contraction maximale. Fait que ça fait partie de moi, vraiment. Puis euh, J'ai comme fait différentes façons. J'ai essayé dans les différentes pièces que j'ai faites à, ben, suite au bac. De, j'ai essayé de faire autre chose, mais on dirait que je me suis juste comme dit ça c'est moi, puis ça je veux juste comme aller dans dans ça, aller dans cette dans cette façon de bouger là parce que ça me représente. Puis j'ai j'ai eu ça. Je, je vais aller je vais arrêter de chercher ailleurs en fait. Um, donc c'est c'est un spectacle quand même très accessible avec les les, oui. les personnages, mais aussi très physique. Donc un, ce qui est parfait pour le fringe parce que ça, ça, ça va chercher un public assez euh, mm -hmm. large. Euh, Puis, à date, est-ce que tu as l'impression que le fringe, c'est vraiment une plateforme que tu souhaites réutiliser ou que tu que t'encourages tu les autres à prendre? Euh, oui, moi, je trouve ça euh, vraiment euh, intéressant pour runner le show, en fait, là, étant donné qu'on a six représentations. Puis là, on a accès quand même à une belle salle là, qui est le Théâtre de la Chapelle. On est heureux de ça. Euh, je trouve ça super parce que là, je me retrouve dans un moment de la création de ce projet-là. C'est pas un projet qui, selon moi, est terminé. Fait qu'on est comme, on a atteint un premier jet, si on peut dire, dans l'étape de la création. Puis là, ben, on le fait six fois. Fait que ça me permet vraiment comme de voir euh, qu à quoi je tiens dans ce spectacle-là, qu'est-ce que je peux enlever, qu que, qu comment ça peut évoluer, qu'est-ce qu'on veut aller voir de plus, euh, qu'est-ce que c'est ça, qu'est-ce qu'on peut creuser. Fait que ça me permet vraiment comme de faire une espèce de plan pour, euh, pour la prochaine étape de la création. Et merci beaucoup. Merci à vous. Donc, finale au sol, on a parlé aujourd'hui avec Liliane Moussa, euh, un spectacle qui est présenté à Théâtre La Chapelle, la salle numéro 10. Euh, et pour l'heure, vous pouvez aller voir sur notre site internet du festival montréalfringe.ca. Our next guest is a repeat guest on the Dirty Feet podcast. It's Andrew Young from Snafu Dance Theater presenting Snack Music at the festival. And uh, the last time we had Andrew on, uh, he did some freestyle rapping at the end of the episode. It was pretty epic. That was back in November when uh, Artichoke Heart Collective was here with We Walk Among You, which was a, a fantastic puppet show. And now Snack Music is, a, let's say, multidisciplinary. You've got music, you've got yeah. puppets, you've got snacks. Yep, all the Snacks is an art form. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Uh, the structure of the show is a bit unique, so maybe you can tell us about how the show actually works. Sure. Uh, so basically how the show works, um, what we're doing with this show and with Snafu in general is we're trying to eliminate the fourth wall in any theater show. Um, so the way that the show works is we get people to tell us a little short two-minute story, and then we reenact it with found object puppetry while somebody improvises music for their story. So they get to tell their story, sit back and watch it animated right in front of them. In the same way that uh, we're trying to build a sense of community, and the same in that uh, I feel personally uh, when I go to a city, um, being from Toronto, it's very much a city of one where everyone is so isolated, there's so many people, but you don't actually know anyone. So what we're trying to do is trying to encourage a sense of community where we're building and sharing stories and sharing food and trying to get together so that 
we actually get to know each other instead of just seeing faces pass in the hall. And you're creating that community across the country too, even just with the members of the of the cast. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so Ingrid and Elliot are both from Victoria originally, and I'm from Toronto. Well, moved to Toronto for school and ended up staying there since. So, um, and then we've I actually met Ingrid while we were traveling across the country last year. Uh, she was doing Kit and Jane, and I was touring with Paleo Oncology, and we ended up just hanging out on dance floors, talking and developing and uh, creating little kind of snippets and talking about how much we love puppetry and how much uh, it speaks to a medium um, that people are able to project themselves onto. And there's this kind of distance between seeing um, seeing an actor on stage and not... Yeah. There's, uh, there, there's a lot of choreography in this show. Um, uh, and more than than I thought there would be, which was really pleasant, uh, as far as the the not only the you know animating these these objects and bringing them to life, but also in the composition and the spacing and and the yeah yeah. Um, so in the same way, we're building community by getting people to tell us stories. We also tell true stories from our lives, um, mm-hmm. and we have kind of developed them not so much within the confines of the little puppet table, but we actually use our bodies and uh, use our physicality to tell our own personal stories from our own lives. Each one of us tell a story that kind of shaped where we are now or how it changed us as a person. Mm-hmm. And um, Ingrid and Elliot are just phenomenal. Uh, they're such physical actors, and they have such high energy, and I just try and keep up. <laughs> but uh, I, I do come from a physical theater background, so that's mm-hmm. kind of where I've versed in that language. And um, we developed... Uh, counterpoints to all of each other's stories so we become the environment we become the animals we become the other people as the person's telling the story and we're able to just jump and shift and change that physicality depending on what the other person needs in our story there's a there's a huge sense of time as well um as far as time management goes for for as performers because there is this improvisational element and taking that risk of the possibility of someone telling a story that maybe goes on a little too long or maybe yeah, totally. is very short. And, and maybe you, in that case, would you guys uh, kind of translate or, or puppet more stories? How do you adjust that? How do you make that type of structure work when there's this huge risk with, with them? Yeah. We, have a, we have a rough framework for the show within like how many stories we'd like to accomplish. Obviously, the more stories that we can tell, the better, because then it brings more people Mm-hmm. into the world and more people sharing stories and more people um, coming into each other's lives. The The time management, how we uh, deal with that is that we have a rough framework and I have a little clock backstage and we would love to tell more stories um, and get people to share back and forth. Um, but it's always just kind of a, kind of a, it's, it's, a, it's a tricky, tricky balance. Basically we, we make it work. We, <laughs> We fit as many stories as we can within the hour, and uh, yeah. Yeah, I think what I appreciated the most about the show, of course, having audience members come up and share their stories, but also seeing you guys share your stories, um, because I I feel like, yeah, that was really great, and and kind of made uh, us appreciate your characters, because they were or you mm-hmm. and it made it a lot easier to share as well yeah there are more and more hands that come up as you guys are being super honest with you know there's the coming out story with um you know having a uh, loss of memory and with you know taking being in this really weird situation i mm-hmm. don't know all of these all of these things uh make it a lot more comfortable and that's purpose, on purpose yeah right? totally <laughs> uh it, it's it's a huge risk for us um to tell our own personal stories Mm -hmm. uh, and just to be ourselves on stage. Um, And that's kind of the whole point of the show is we're asking people to take a risk and come with us, but we want to show them first that we are willing to go hand in hand with them on stage and share our stories so we can be all in this thing together. Can we talk maybe about the music elements of the show? Absolutely. Great. So uh, how does this manifest and uh, where does it come from? Uh, Well, Elliot is, um, he's been in, piano player for about 22 years and he improvises uh scores to under uh, he improvises underscores for the entire puppetry scenes as well he's he created all the transition sounds and all the the beatboxing that happens in the show um 
and he is just an amazingly gifted musician that he's able to just pick up things or throw in little touches of sound to really accentuate what we're doing on the table and what we're doing on the table helps with the music. He, the way that the, the show works is Elliot's able to... He has a couple of instruments and a couple of synths on the piano where he gets the audience to choose which one they like the best and then he creates that theme and then shapes the story around whatever uh, the audience's suggestion is. I like that. I like giving the audience a choice for what they get to listen to next. So we've been speaking with Andrew Young from Snack Music, which is a a show by Snafu Dance Theater. Uh, When's your next show? Uh, Our next show is Thursday at 6 o'clock, and we're over at the Mai. Perfect. All right. Uh, Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, we're going to be talking about Triptych, which is a, a show, a theater piece from New York. Put on by Luciani's Absolute Theater. We're going to be speaking with the man in charge uh, today, Guido Luciani. And uh, as far as I understand, it's not simply a, a theater company, but also a, a sort of a technique. So, Guido, thank you for being here. And uh, thank you for having it. And uh, can you let us know a bit more about Absolute Theater? Okay, Absolute Theater is the um, what I call it. Uh, um, uh, a technique comes from a technique that I coach that I've been working with all my life. Uh, I call it the the basic technique. I call it uh, the um, resonance technique. Uh, what it is is uh, it uses the. Um, it, it believes that I believe that our creative energy, our creative power comes from actually from our sexual power, from our sexual energy, uh, and it's, the, uh, it's just misinterpreted that people think that sexuality is just about having sex, but uh, sexuality, like other cultures understand, is actually our life source. So basically the origin of that technique is, is using that that energy to to create the presence, to create the resonance, uh, uh, and it's not just for actors or dancers or performers. I have uh, used it for regular people that want to to talk in public. So uh, so anyway, the absolute technique is that technique elevated to its max. Is uh, I call it the no limits version of the, the of the resonance technique. Uh, so the play that we are putting now, Triptych, is sort of a representation of that technique. Uh, so as the name implies, absolute, is uh, because I believe that, uh, that the theater has sort of lost part of, uh, it has become, some theater has become very brainy and uh, had abandoned the entire body. Uh, it just becomes to like a choreographer or a movement or move there, do this. And uh, in the absolute theater, it comes from our senses. Uh, once we wake up those senses, that's what it guides us to move or to create the movement that, that we have on stage. Um, so it's a very instinctive, in a way, kind of movement. And uh, so, yeah, uh, but there is also the textual part uh, because it's a balance uh, between the two. So, What would, um, of this absolute technique of an exercise, what type of exercise would that be to get in, as far as the get in touch with the senses and maybe describe that to us to give us a better impression of, of uh, the approach? Yeah, uh, basically it's uh, uh, some people compare it to meditation I call it uh, going into what I call a bear character. Uh, some people are aware a little bit of this, uh, what uh, Grotowski called the holy actor. It's basically guided by the same thing, which is like stripping down to your bear character, to to your soul. So uh, you you sort of block every sense. It's like if you went in a flotation tank, you block mm-hmm. every sense, and then you open the map, and then whatever experience comes up is whatever is right on the stage. So we don't bring anything from outside. 
we, we, we take the social turn off the sensors and turn them back on and then you use what the, the, the sensory information you're getting from, from the space, mm -hmm. which I call it the sacred space, and from the audience. So, uh, so that's the, the technique is basically takes a lot of focus in. It's, it's just like stripping down, letting everything from the outside world out including techniques, <laughs> which is the part that most actors have problem with because uh, you have trained and you have worked a lot for creating this technique and then I'll ask you, okay, forget all about it. You need to come here like naked, bare. You don't need to have anything here. It's just whatever you have here. So, uh, yes, it's a matter of letting go and, and mm -hmm. that's very difficult for me. Uh, well, another very important thing in this technique is, uh, like in this piece, is that uh, actors don't get to play other people, they get to play themselves, which is also very scary for, for, for most people, uh, because uh, you, have, you don't have a lot of things that you have in a regular play, which is like relationships or, or, or connection with the other characters or or something to hold on, so so it's just like you're like naked and you're thrown in a roaring river and you have to fence for yourself. So that's basically is going to be very intimidating for a lot of a lot of people. That balance between having to um, you mentioned having to let everything go, right? Um, also, like leaving. Uh, you know, if you're if you have a, a certain technique training, or right. to leave that at the door and kind of just yeah. arrive bare. Do you, do you find you have a tendency of working with people who are maybe untrained, so that you can work with with something that's a little more pure in that I sense? Have, I have figured out. I've been doing this all my life, and uh, I have figured out that there's like the two perfect candidates mm -hmm. for this kind of work is either people at the very beginning that don't have anything to lose. So that you can uh, shape them right, into... Right, because mm -hmm. they don't have any baggage, they don't have anything that, that, oh, I have to hold on to that. And either that or very, very, very experienced actors that take it as a challenge. Uh, it's just like, okay, I'm going to take the plunge, I'm going to let everything go and see what happens. But people in between have a lot of trouble of letting go of all the things, so... Mm -hmm. Yes. And yourself, what is the what is the thing you have the most trouble letting go when it comes to performing and, and creating this piece? I think for me it's uh, probably letting go of uh, of the things that I really believe in, and uh, and uh, I I understand this is a very difficult thing to as actors and uh, that to work with, and uh, so. Um, for me, I have to let go, and I would say I would have make sacrifices in order to have a show, in order to do something, and uh, I don't believe in compromise. <laughs> uh, the work says no limits, so uh, I don't believe. Uh, a lot of the things, and a lot of the things in display uh, is judgment. Uh, one of my things is no judgment, I, I think, that, and uh, so so that's the most difficult for me not to i believe that if you if you're asking the audience or if you're inspiring the audience not to judge uh the first one who has not to judge is yourself otherwise if you judge it they'll judge it and uh, so for me it's hard working with other people because when i when i'm in myself i don't care but it's not that i don't care but i i I, I I don't have any judges of myself, but uh, when when I'm working with somebody, uh, it's a point of, okay, uh, am I judging it? Am I judging what the other person is? This other person doing what uh, what I need to be done? And uh, and and the same thing with the audience. I say, okay, are they judging? So in the moment that I say, okay, is it judging it? Then I'm judging it. So that's the the hardest part for me. Great. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank We've you. We've been speaking with Guido Luciani about Luci Luciani's Absolute Theatre show here at 
at the Montreal Fringe called Triptych. And uh, your venue is uh, the Black Theatre Workshop, so that's venue 8. So you can get uh, dates and times at montrealfringe.ca. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that concludes our coverage of the 25th St. Amboise Montreal Fringe Festival. Uh, you can listen to part one, uh, which we released last week, if you want to hear about more dance shows and uh, movement shows at the festival. And uh, in a couple weeks, we're going to be bringing you coverage of the Toronto Fringe Festival. Until then. The Dirty Feet Podcast is produced and hosted by Produit et animé par Alison Burns J.D. Papillon et Stéphanie Morin-Robert We have Mainline Theatre, Montreal Improv Theatre and Paula Flalo to thank. Merci pour le soutien. Vous pouvez visiter notre site web, écouter les derniers épisodes, lire notre blog, nous aimer sur Facebook et nous suivre sur Twitter. You can visit our website, listen to past episodes, read our blog, like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. Show us some love and help us spread the word. Montrez-nous un peu d'amour et aidez-nous à passer le mot.